to the question, why would you be allowed to go to heaven? Over the course of the years, I've heard a lot of reasons that people think that they or a loved one would be allowed to go to heaven. They were a good person. Anybody ever met good people? You ever met good people that would not say that they were a Christian, that they were a good person? Um, some people think, well, they've done a lot of good things as, as a reason to get into heaven. That, um, you know, their family, they came from a good family who went to church, and they went to church all their life. And there are people who go to church all their life but never make a commitment to Christ. But they think church attendance means you get to go to heaven. Paul delves into this question a little bit of why we go to heaven and what makes us right with God. See, Paul came from a background that as a Jew, and we're going to see Paul's going to list toward the end of this in verses 4 through 6 in chapter 3. He's going to list seven qualifications that he has that I don't have. Okay? That, and I can't have most of them. But he has them. And he says that those were the conditions that I should go. But what he's making the point is, they're not. So whether or not you've attended church all your life doesn't put you in, as we sang that song, Win the Roll, Called up yonder, that doesn't put you on the roll coming to church. I'm glad you're here. Don't stop coming. Just because you do good works doesn't put you in heaven. And I'm glad you do them. Keep doing them. Just because you're good, and praise the Lord that you are good, we like to have good people as, that are around us as friends. That doesn't mean you're going to heaven. There's only one thing. We've sung about this point, the victory we have in Jesus by his blood. And that, that makes us who we are in him. So today we're going to look at the first six verses of chapter 3 of Philippians. And I've given it the title, The Joy of Humility. And the reason why I've given it that title is when we understand the things that we've done in life or where we've come from in life or the status that we have in here in this life matters nothing as far as eternity. It really humbles us and it calls us to be humble because of what God has done. It's not about us. I want you to understand that today. Our salvation is not about what we can do. It's about the person of Jesus. And that's, that's amazing when you think about it, that we've all come from different backgrounds. We've all had different experiences in our life. Some of you have been terrible people. Now, I don't know any of you that, in that way. But some of you said, Pastor, if you only knew some of the stuff I did when I was younger. Okay, I don't need to. Because what's the only thing that matters is what Jesus has done in our lives today. That's all that matters. Your past is your past. He's cleansed it. He's washed it away. He's given you a new name. He's given you a, you're a new creation. You're, you're, in him, you're different. So trust him. So let's pray right now. Father, we want to thank you for your blessings and your goodness. We thank you for your love. We ask, Lord, that you touch our hearts, open up our minds to receive your word today. Lord, I pray that, Lord, that you will help us to grow today in you. Lord, I pray for our country today. The Lord, that you will touch our leaders, that, Lord, they will use the godly wisdom that they give. And, Lord, as we head into the election, the Lord, that you will guide us into who to vote for. Lord, I pray, the Lord, that you will continue to touch your people, that you'll touch Israel. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem today. The Lord, that you will exalt your people. You'll put a hedge about them. And that, Lord, they will be protected. And, Lord, we pray for your church and Believers around the world, Lord, even those that are being persecuted, that, Lord, hope and joy and peace will be renewed and restored, and that, Lord, you will bring them through. 
But Lord, above all, that we, every one of us will see you as our blessing and as our hope. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're talking about joy, the joy of humility, and we're looking at um, Philippians 3. So let's read the first two verses. We're going to look at the Apostle's serious warning. He gives us a warning in the first um, two verses. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. So what's the first thing he says? Rejoice in the Lord. Everybody say rejoice. Rejoice. Have joy today in who? The Lord. the Lord, not in yourself, not in all this stuff, but rejoice. The Lord says, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. You know what? I don't get tired of telling you these things because it's good for you. So rejoice. Rejoice in him. Rejoice in the Lord. And then he gives a warning. <laughs> beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. And beware of the mutilation. Now when he talks about dogs, he's not talking about the little puppies. He's not saying as you walk down the street, be careful of the dogs that will come and bite your ankle. That's not what he's talking about. Here he's talking about People, and he's talking about the evil workers, and he's talking about, and actually in the Bible, to call somebody a dog, and even still today, if somebody calls you a dog, how does it make you feel? That was terrible. <laughs> Anybody hear that? Rough. Okay. Okay. I hope that didn't pick that up, but. But, you know, but here, and of course, the Jews called the Gentiles what? Dogs. When the woman came to Christ, it's not good to give to the, 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 the bread to, to the dogs. He goes, but even the dogs get the crumbs. The woman did. So see, what we've got to understand when he's talking about beware of the dogs. It refers to those who are vulgar. Paul referred to false teachers or the Judaizers. The Jews, Chris, Jewish Christians that were trying to get the Gentile Christians to do like the Jews, he calls them dogs. He said, beware of the dogs. And he also says, beware of evil workers. See, false teachers were, were self-centered, seeking to build up their own reputation and their own following. They would infiltrate churches and try to undermine the truth with their mix of truth and error. And what we, we're going to look at what that truth and error, but what it basically was this. You've become a Christian, but now you have to be a Jew also. You have to follow the feast. You have to be circumcised. You have to have all you have to do all of these things like we do as Jewish Christians. And that's why the next thing he says is beware of the mutilation. Circumcision was part of the Jewish observance required of all males. But even in the Old Testament, if we're going to read you a scripture, the physical circumcision was a sign of true circumcision. Look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 6 as it comes up. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. Deuteronomy is written written to the Israelites, the Jewish nation, but says he's going to circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. See, what circumcision did, it set aside the Jewish people from the pagan nations. It was started back with Abraham and, and um, Ishmael. They were circumcised, and then on the eighth day, every Jewish male was to be circumcised. If you read in the um, Christmas story, Jesus was circumcised on, on the eighth day. It happened. It was something that set them apart. And what they were saying, though, was this. The false teachers and the dogs and the mutilation. See, Paul uses that term mutilation as to say, you know what? It's not going to save you if you are. It's not going to change your eternal destination just because you've been circumcised. Because see, in Ephesians chapter 2, it tells us this. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. See, no matter what happens in this life, nothing you do in this life changes your eternal destination. It's Jesus. A lot of Christians would like to add, well, now that you're saved, but to be saved, you have to add this to it. No, there's nothing we add to what Jesus has done. It's enough. It's more than enough. It covers everything. We're saved by grace. Grace and nothing needs to be added to faith to be saved. So Paul's given them this warning. But then it goes on. That there's, the apostle talks about spiritual worship. See, the Jews were really caught up in tradition. And you follow this uh, festival. And you do this. And you do that. And you have this sacrifice. What he's saying, it's not about that anymore. It's about worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Look at verse 3. Go to, go to the next slide, Nick. It says, verse 3 says, for we are the circumcision. You know what Paul's saying? Those that have been saved by grace through faith are the circumcision now. It's not those that follow the law. It's those that have been saved by grace through faith. It says we are the circumcision who worship God. He gives three things that happen. Worship God how? In the spirit. He says we worship God in the spirit. Spirit. When the Samaritan woman came to Jesus, he said, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The legalists worshiped in the fleshly and external way. We come, well, our worship comes from the heart, not from all of these acts. That's how they worship. He said, we worship, we rejoice in Christ Jesus. We worship in spirit. And we rejoice in Christ Jesus. Why do we rejoice in him? He's the source of our joy. He's the source of our life. He's the source of our hope. He's the source of our everything. And so when we're, when, if Paul says, you know what? Because of these things, we're the circumcision because we, we worship in the spirit. We don't follow the letter of this law and all of that. We rejoice in Jesus. It's not about the sacrifices and all this stuff. It's simply about Jesus. We rejoice in him. Why? He's our hope. He's our source. He's our strength. He's our everything. He is the one that died on the cross to save us. He's our help in a time of trouble. Jesus is everything. But then he also says, says rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. If you remember well, just a few minutes ago when I started, I said, you know what? A lot of times we think the things that we do can save us. You know what that, what that is? That's putting confidence in the flesh. I've done enough. God will accept me. I've been good enough. You know what? I'm okay. This has happened. I, I've, I've accomplished this. He will accept me. I'm telling you today, we cannot have confidence in our flesh, it will let us down. Over and over and over, our flesh lets us down. Our way of doing things, our way of thinking lets us, down, lets us down. And Paul is saying, we are the circumcision. Why? Because we worship in spirit. We're not following the letter of this law. We're not doing the sacrifices. We're not going back to that. We rejoice in Christ Jesus. It's not our heritage. It's not who we are. It's based upon Christ. And they said that we don't put confidence in our flesh, in ourselves. That's why he can say, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. It's about Jesus. It's about what he's done. It's about what he's doing in my life and in my heart. And it's what he's continuing to work in me. It's not about me. We can't have confidence in our flesh. What gets us in trouble most of the time? Your flesh. That's what gets you in trouble. What you want. Your desires. We can't trust in that. And then in those last three verses of, the, of, of verses 1 through 6, he talks about his seven, the apostle's seven assets. 
though I also might have confidence in the flesh. What is Paul saying? I might have confidence in my flesh. Paul said, you know what? He's going to go through some things here, seven things. He said, you know what? Because of these seven things, I could have confidence. I could have hope. Some of you here today, and maybe some people watching, like, you know what, Pastor, I know what you're saying, but look what Paul says here. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I'm more so. Paul's saying, you know, I might have confidence in it. If anyone else thinks they do, I got more. I'm trust, I, could, I could trust more in me. Because this is what he says. He was circumcised the eighth day. So what the first requirement for all Jews was to be what? Circumcised. God said, this is what's going to set you apart. This is what's going to make you acceptable. This is what you have to do. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. We can read all down through there, all males were, starting with Abraham and Ishmael, and how it was required, and it set them apart from the pagan nation. He said, I was circumcised the eighth day. And then he goes on and says, what? Of the stock of Israel. Paul was a descendant of Abraham, of Israel, or Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes. Paul was a pure blood Jew. Not a Gentile convert. See, in 2 Corinthians 11, 22, he says this. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Paul was saying, you know what, I was circumcised. But now listen, it goes beyond that. I am of the stock of Israel. He says, you know what he says? Are they Hebrews? I'm a Hebrew. I'm an Israelite. I'm a seed, the seed of Abraham. I've got it all. He said, you know what? I got the name. I got the bloodline. I come from the right family. How many people think because of who they are, they get accepted? Paul said, I've got it. I've got it. Then he goes on and says, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Of the tribe of Benjamin. Now this this is special. Benjamin was um, the last of Jacob's twelve sons, and his older brother was Joseph, the one with the coat of many colors, and the, and their mother was Rachel, and Rachel was the most beloved wife of of, of, of Jacob, and Saul, the first king of Israel, was also a Benjamite. He says, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, there are some scholars who believe that Saul, Paul, who was named Saul, and I don't want to get you confused right now, okay? So Paul, when we first hear about him, he's named Saul, but his, Saul, his name changes to Paul, okay? So what was Paul's original name? Saul. And then Saul was changed to Paul. Paul. Some people believe that he, with his original name, Saul, he might have been named after King Saul because he was from the tribe of Benjamin as Paul was. So, so look, let's think about it. Not only was I circumcised, so that makes me accepted as a Jew, but I am an Israelite, a Hebrew. He goes, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, which where King Saul was from, our first king. I was there. I was maybe named after him. Think about the pride that that could bring up and the clout. And you know what? That's me. But then he goes on, he says a couple of more things here. He says, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was not just an average Jew. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He had all the right training. He knew all of the law. He was orthodox. He valued his heredity, his, his spiritual purity. He received a rabbi's education from a, one, a, a, a rabbi's a, a scholar, Gamaliel, one of Israel's most respected prophets. See, Acts 22, verse 3 tells us this. I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Sicilia, and brought up in the city of 
at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. So he wasn't just a passive Jew. He wasn't, well, you know, I was born a Jew, so I'll be a Jew. No, it was like, you know, this is who I am. You know what? Yes, I've been circumcised. I'm an Israelite. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, and I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Kind of, you know, uh, other phrases we would talk about, king of kings and lord of lords. Paul was saying, I am the Hebrew of the Hebrews. You might be a Hebrew, but I am a Hebrew. I am the top. I've got it all. I've, I've learned it all. I know how to do it all. I'm a Hebrew. Paul said, you know what? I've got it. You all got confidence in your flesh? Let me tell you what i got. This is what I've got. But then he goes on and tells them this. Concerning the law, he was a Pharisee. Now, if you go through the New Testament and Jesus' ministry, the Pharisees were the ones who often gave Jesus problems. They were the ones that were accusing of him. And the, the Pharisees were very, very, very conservative. Now today we talk about in our politics that there's conservatives and liberals. The Pharisees were the conservative <laughs> side. The Sadducees, I like that name. I remember a song when we used to teach children's church, the Sadducees or Sadducee. Um, that they were the liberal side. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They were the liberal ones. But the Pharisees, they followed the law. And they even took the law to the nth degree where it became hard to even live sometimes with how they wanted to do the law. They were the ones that condemned people because of what they had done in the past. And oh, you, you were just terrible. And if you were lower class, the Pharisees would look, would look down upon you. Galatians 1.14 tells us this. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation being more exceedingly zealous for the tradition of my father. What was Paul concerned about? He wasn't concerned about God. He was concerned about the traditions and following all of the things he was supposed to. And then the next, next scripture, go to it next. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify that according to to the strictest sect of our religion, I live a Pharisee. So Paul says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm an Israelite. I'm a big from the tribe of Benjamin, where King Saul came from. That's where I came from. I was the Hebrew of the Hebrews. You know what? I wasn't just a Hebrew. I was I was a Hebrew. I was the top of the line. I was I was I was the Hebrew. And then he goes on and says, you know what? Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. I was of the strictest kind. And then he adds something else here. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. You know what? Not only was I all of this stuff that put me at the top, but I went a little bit further than the most, most people. I said, you know what? I'm going to persecute the church. I'm going to persecute the people that are following that guy, Jesus, that want the of the way. I'm going to persecute them. I'm going to bring them down. Why? Because they're getting away from what we were taught by Abraham and our forefathers. We're getting away from that. So what he's saying here, look in Acts 22, look what happens here. He goes, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivered into prison both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness and all the council of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. See, on the way, even on the way to his conversion at the, uh, on the road to Damascus, Paul was going to arrest Christians and have them persecuted. Paul said, you know what? I'm all of these things. I'm at the top of the food chain, but I went even further because I said, you know what? I'm going to take my life and I'm going to use it to persecute the people that won't follow the way that I am. But then the last qualification that he gives is this. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. The 
But this is where it goes back to trust in the flesh. All of the stuff that was in the law, you know what I did? I did it all. According to the righteousness of the law, which was keeping the feasts, keeping the festivals, keeping the Sabbath, doing all the sacrifices, following all the things that he was taught from his youth, even as a Pharisee, the things that he did. He says, you know what? According to the law, I was blameless. So here's the point of what Paul is saying. We think we've got it together. But Paul, who says, you know what? This is what I had. Let me tell you everything that I thought made me qualified. None of it mattered when it came to Jesus and my <laughs> salvation and my hope that's in him. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you might what what title you may attach to yourself. I don't care if you're a king or a queen. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're the best in your business or if you're at your lowest spot. It doesn't matter if you've got money or you don't have money. None of those things matter. All that matters is that we know Jesus. All that matters is that we've been saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. And that is not a work. Everything that Paul has named here, that is work faith. That's flesh faith. And none of that is going to matter at the end. It's all about Jesus. It's all about him. But Paul is saying, you know what? You beware of people who are coming in and say, you know what? Now that you've been saved, you've got to do this, 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 and this. Or you have to do this in order to be saved, and you've got to do this, this, and this. He says, no, it's all by grace. It's all through faith in Christ Jesus. That's what it's all about. And I'm going to read one more verse. That's not, we're going to start with it next week, but I'm going to throw it in here. So if you had your Bibles and you're in Philippians 3, it's verse 7. But what things were gained to me? Now listen to that. But what things were gained to me? What was gained to him? I've been circumcised. I'm an Israelite. I'm, I'm, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I persecuted the Christians. I, of the law, I'm righteous. I'm blameless. All of these things he named. You know what? He goes, but what things were gained to me, to the world, these I have counted lost for Christ. All of the things that we think in this life matter, matter not to gain Christ. It's all by grace through faith. Listen, I want you to be the Christian of Christians. Oh, I do. Boy, I want you to leave a good name to your children when, when you go. I want you to do the good works that Paul was talking about and all of those things, how he persecuted Christians and he did the right things under the law. I want, you to, I want you to be holy. I want you to be righteous. I want you to be all of that. But I want you to understand all of that's got to come from the base of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if it doesn't, it matters nothing. In the end, when we die, the only thing that's going to matter is do we know Jesus Christ as our Savior and what have we done for him through that? It's not going to be based on anything else. And Paul is saying, you know what? I had all of this, but none of it matters. It's all about him. See, that's where we got to come humbly in humility. Before him, I don't have a name. That, that, that's powerful. That's exalted. I come to him. Scripture talks about it as a child. Childlike faith. We just come. We just come to him. But see, so many times we think, well... You know what? In this world, people listen to me. God will listen. In this world, I'm important. I'm important to God. In this world, I'm somebody, and I got clout. I'll carry the same. No, no, no. It's all by grace through faith. I don't care if you're the most exalted person in this world or you're, you're the most lowest person. It doesn't matter. If you're a beggar or if you're a billionaire, it's all based on grace through faith in Jesus. That's all it is. And that's what, that's what Paul's getting at. He so says, you be aware of these people that are coming in and saying, you've got to add something to your faith. We have people that are coming in and saying, you know what, you've got to add something here in order to do that and be that. He says, no, it's all because of Jesus. It's not because of this stuff. Yeah, I've got it all. 
but it matters nothing. I count it all lost for Christ. It's all gone for him. Paul didn't go around and say, well, you listen. <laughs> I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. You all need to listen to me preach. He didn't go into everywhere he went. He went the first place he usually went seemed like to be the synagogue. He walked in there. You know why? He knew the law. He knew what their traditions was. He was able to speak to them from that and open up the word and show that it's Jesus. But it all came back to Jesus, not him. That was just an avenue to open doors. See, what you've got and what you've been and what you've done and who you are, it opens doors for you. It does not define you for God. Now, if I had the name Trump, it would open some of your doors. Oh, you're a Trump. Let me come in. Let me talk. Tell me about Donald. Or if I had the name of somebody else, you'd open up a door and say, come in, let, talk to me. My name might open doors. Now, if I come to your door and say, I'm Philip Morgan, that ain't going to open the door. Okay? But we names open doors. Sometimes the, the car you drive might open doors. But you know what? That's all that, that, that's not defining. That just gives you an avenue to share about Jesus. That's not who you are. It's not who you are. It's all about him. It's all about grace through faith in him. That changes everything. So if you leave here today with anything, here's what I want you to understand. Jesus is above everything. Your past, your traditions, your good life, your good name, your money, your works, all of that in light of eternity means nothing. All that matters is Jesus. It's Jesus. We've got to trust him, put our life in him, and be saved by grace through faith. Not because we've attended church, not because we've read enough scriptures, not because we've prayed enough, not because we've done this, not done that. No. Have you placed your faith in Jesus? It's all about him. Would you bow your head? Father, we thank you today that you are everything. That Jesus came to love us and to die for us and to make a way for us. So Lord, we thank you that today that that way has been made. Lord, help us today not to trust in ourselves, not to trust in the flesh, not to trust in the do's and the don'ts that we that the law says for us to do, but Lord, to trust simply in you. Thank you, Jesus, that you came and you died for us and that by your blood our sin can be washed away. Thank you for the grace that you give us that covers everything and it gives us hope. Thank you that you love us so much that you came to die for us so that we can be saved. Your head's bowed right now. I want you to simply talk to the Lord right now. As Holy Spirit leads you, have you been trusting in yourself? Have you never made a commitment to Christ? Maybe right now the Spirit is drawing to you. Maybe right now the Spirit is speaking to your heart. And you need to make a relationship with Jesus that, that's based on grace through faith and not on works in your flesh. <laughs> right now, you talk to the Lord in your own way. Right now, you speak to If you're here today, Maybe you're watching and you don't know don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, but 
the Spirit is speaking to your heart and you know that you need a Savior. I'm going to pray a prayer. You can pray your own prayer, but I'm going to pray a prayer right now that comes straight from Scripture. And if, if you know that you need to be saved, that you need Jesus as your Savior to wash all of your sin away, I want you to pray this prayer with me and I want you to believe as you pray it. And the Scripture says you shall be saved. Say, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross and that you rose from the dead. And based on that confession, according to your word, I am saved. Thank you for changing my life and making me a new creation. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand right now? We're going to sing this song one more. The first verse in the chorus of this song, it says,